to start off by mentioning, as you, at least some of you will know, um, in my work over the last uh, probably 15 to 20 years, I've used a lot of recycled material. Um, or if it's not recycled, it's, it's, it's a substance which has had an earlier life. Uh, and curiously, um, each time I've done what's turned out to be quite a major work uh, in a particular material, it seems to have become rapidly obsolete. Um, this happened with the work I did with the sardine tins. Not long after I made that work, uh, they stopped making the cans with the keys that, that open the can. It's now all the boring, by comparison, ring pull. And then I made a work some years later, uh, knitting uh, videotape, and of course soon after that, videotape has become an archaic medium. And I have joked to people in relatively recent times, uh, oh, and I've also used banknotes to paint, to paint botanical species on, um, which many of which have been long out of date. And I've joked to people uh, that the American dollar, well, I'll wait and see how long that's going to take before it becomes obsolete. <laughs> and then, uh, oh, maybe three or four weeks ago, I was in Brisbane for the day for meetings about the kids' project room. And I did an interview for the uh, Queensland Art Gallery's blog site. And one of the interesting questions that was asked me was, how, how does this work fit in now with the current crises in the financial, the global financial world? And I hadn't actually thought about this because I had the idea uh, for this work in 2000 when I was wandering through a museum in London uh, and looking at these extraordinary birds' nests. And don't ask me why the idea just kind of came like a an arrow in one side of my quite peculiar brain, but it just did. It just came and lodged there and, you know, occasionally you get an idea and you think, oh, yeah, you know, there's something there. Um, the idea of making birds' nests out of shredded American dollars. Uh, and of course, when I had that idea, I knew immediately that, you know, uh, the, the, the concept of working with the American dollar was that the greenback for decades, I suppose since the end of the Second World War, has been the currency of desire in the rest of the world, um, and particularly in you know, the non-first world parts of the world, which is the majority of the world. Um, uh, and most people here have probably traveled to places where people would prefer American dollars rather than their own currency. And then suddenly, what with recent global <coughs> events, uh, that all seems to be changing. And perhaps for me, psychologically, without me realizing, uh, that changed um, after 9-11. Because uh, with the American response by um, uh, going into Iraq uh, as a response to 9-11 and a very misguided, mistaken response in my personal um, uh, estimation. Um, I think that, well, certainly for myself and for ha perhaps a lot of other uh, citizens of this first world, uh, America got to be somewhat on the nose and all things on America got to be somewhat on the nose. Um, and the greenback, the American dollar, seems to speak uh, very eloquently um, of what America stood for. America stood for wealth and power um, uh, and supremacy. Uh, and I suppose for me subconsciously, you know, when I thought about this work, or even consciously, there were reasons why I chose to work with the American dollar in this work, because although it's not just the USA who are responsible for um, the ills of the natural world, which we're at last waking up to, but they do epitomize the first world uh, taking too much from the environment and from third world countries through our production of you know, goods, agriculture, whatever. And then now, um, well I had that idea in 2000, so now 10 years later, uh, my attitude towards the American dollar is different. I'm not going to stand here and say the American dollar's on the way out yet. But certainly, in very recent times, what with the global financial downturn, to me personally, it doesn't seem to have the same uh, 
strength that it once had. And I mean, I don't know if other people would agree with that, but um, I found that coming back to this work now, several years after I've made it to, you know, to revisit it, you know, by having it installed here. And, you know, it's always a bit strange as an artist um, when you've made a work and then you, re you revisit it, you know, at some later point, you know, physically you see it in an institution or whatever. And you always are confronted by where you were at in your head then, and as opposed to where you're at now, and then look at the work quite critically, you know. I mean, you hear of painters who go in and want to, you know, paint some more on their canvas. I mean, I can understand that, you know, even if it's hanging in the Art Gallery of New South Wales or the, Nat the National Gallery in London or whatever, because I think we come back and we look at our work, you know, with, with a sense of critical appraisal and maybe a certain kind of dubious sort of sense of, you know, how it matches up to um, our current way of thinking. Um, this matches up for me okay, by the way, even though I've moved on from, from it. So I suppose that's by way of introduction to, to talk about the... Oh, by the way, tell me, someone's keeping track of time. I am. I'll just talk until... Well, I won't talk until we run out of time because I want to open it up for questions. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, when I made this work, I was beginning more and more consciously to make work that brought together uh, what I see as the ills and indeed the demise of the natural world that we are indeed part of, although we don't live our lives um, uh, with, with giving much conscious thought to that on a daily basis, I would say. Um, so trying to enmesh that with uh, some, some kind of political comment and, that, and often that enmeshing is done through the choice of material because the material, materials I often work with are loaded or I try to load them in the work so that when you look at the work, what you're looking at often in some of my works like this one is honed down where it's just one material um, uh, making one kind of thing, but with a multiplicity and um, endeavouring to have a layering of, of, of concepts. So for me, when I look at this, uh, the ideas that were resonant when I had the initial concept and then when I was slowly working on it were ideas about, as I said, the natural world and our part of, in it and how we've become such a globalised place, for better or worse, for both really, that uh, that's had a really problematic impact on the natural world. And it's, it's sort of, I was going to say it's reassuring, it's not reassuring, but it's actually good to see that at last we're having a global debate about things like climate change, uh, pollution, um, carbon footprints and so on. I mean that debate you know, it has become a political football, but at least it's out there. Five years ago, maybe even three years ago, it really wasn't. And that for me is uh, at least some positive sign of a, 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 a global awareness in a good way that makes me feel not that I belong to a simply an, or only to a world which is uh, seems to be ever more crumbling on a daily basis, but a world which in good ways is becoming more of a global village or so. So, um, uh, yeah, I could tell you all sorts of stories about my encounters with birds, nests and curators in museums and in Sri Lanka and indeed in Guyana, where uh, some of these nests were collected and where I variously made them. But perhaps I'll... Um, Julie, how are we doing for time? I want to leave a good amount of time for questions, and if we don't have questions, I can keep talking. We're doing very well for time, but I was wondering whether um, you would want to tell people how many nests there are, because it's a bit deceptive, and whether we sh should ask you to talk about the tailor bird and the weaver bird and a couple of the specific different habitats. Okay. Well, um, I was reminded yesterday when I spoke to the members that there are 86 nests. I'd sort of forgotten. Um, and. I'll tell you that the gallery that I show at, um, my gallerist who I love dearly, 
wanted me to, you know, it's like, why, why do you have to make so many, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I just do. But I mean, the reason for making so many was um, uh, in large part because of my increasing wonder and fascination and respect for uh, what birds can achieve. And indeed, that's, that's been, that's uh, helped me leapfrog into also looking at other forms of so-called animal architecture, like uh, the amazing uh, nests that the so-called social insects make, like wasps, uh, bees, ants, termites, which I've, in another work, which um, was shown in uh, my show at the MCA in Sydney, uh, called the Castles in the Air of the Cave Dwellers. So through this work, I've become really interested in, um, I suppose for want of a better word, the, the consciousness, in fact, the intelligence of creatures that we um, take for granted as being sort of out there in the world, share, sharing the planet with us, although we're giving them less and less space to do that. Um, but for most of us with very little awareness or interest really, because most of us live in urban situations for a start, so we don't actually encounter a lot of these things. Um, but the extraordinary uh, know-how that they have genetically amassed through evolution to actually be able to uh, be such um, to, to be such magnificent architects to purpose build uh, a habitat for raising the next generation, which is absolutely perfect for the climate to protect uh, the eggs and the chicks from predators and so on. Um, so to give you a couple of extraordinary examples of that, uh, two of the nests I made in Sri Lanka, one of them, uh, it's a little one just here that's actually got uh, a couple of American dollars sort of draped over it. It's, it's, it's a, a little bird called uh, the Taylor bird and um, it, you'd also find it in southern India and I think the M Malay Peninsula and, and the Philippines. Uh, and it, it's called the Taylor bird because it, it actually stitches um, uh, its nesting material through uh, the, uh, the, the two sides of the leaf on either side of the, <coughs> of the midrib. Uh, if it's a large leaf down towards the bottom of the leaf. Um, and the leaf actually acts in a tropical climate like a canopy uh, for the rain to uh, run off. And the leaf, of course, is attached to the tree um, while the bird is nesting. And as uh, one of my very good friends where I stay in Sri Lanka pointed out, even the tip of the leaf is like a conduit uh, to actually lead the water flowing over the leaf to, to, to run off the tip. Um, and um, oh, while I'm at it, there's another one here, uh, a, a sunbird, which is one of two, nest, two sunbirds' nests I've made. The other one is a northern Queensland species. This one is an Asian species. And it has a little portico uh, on one side uh, with a little kind of thrin fringe at the front, which also helps the water in well, a tropical place like Southeast Asia or northern Queensland in the wet season to run off. Another of the amazing nests is, uh, the common name is the Bio Weaver. There's a few examples I've made here. I think I made a few because they're so magnificent. Um, these very long nests, there's one in the far cabinet that is well over a metre long. Um, and it's no exaggeration of how long they can be. There's one in the British Museum, probably on permanent display in the, not the British Museum, sorry, the British Museum of Natural History. Um, uh, that I photographed that was indeed longer than that one um, in, in their bird section. Um, and it's, it, it's a tiny bird uh, and it has to make, it makes that nest hanging from the branch of a tree uh, and it starts off with its beak and its feet. It has to tie a knot with one piece of grass or in the case of some of these in Sri Lanka, coconut fibre around the branch and then build the whole thing from there, and there's a wonderful piece of footage I remember watching years ago, I've only ever seen once, but in David Attenborough's series, The Life of Birds, there must be like a whole episode where he looks at uh, nesting. Um, and he, there's wonderful footage of the expert weaver bird, uh, who's obviously done it a few times before, um, going about his business making his nest, and then there's the novice one, who can't even tie the first knot, you know, he's all, um, 
uh, well, we would say he's all fingers and thumbs, but his beak and his feet don't seem to be able to get it quite right. And then the females are off towards the edge of the clearing, um, uh, just watching. <laughs> it must be quite unnerving for the males. And indeed, when I've been making these nets, I've thought a lot. And this is an interesting thing for me. I never really thought about it before. But it's something I think I've carried over into my work more generally now. I thought a lot about what birds think about. You know, I've thought about the personality of a species because I've learnt from making these at the pigeons. There is a pigeon's nest somewhere, but they basically just thrust a few sticks together one way and the other. Um, and it's like a platform. Uh, and you think, surely the eggs will fall through between the sticks. They seem to be, you know, the, the, the birds that just want to get it over and done with pretty quickly. And then you've got like the weaver bird that spends, must be a long time, you know, making that nest quite meticulously. Um, and oh, by the way, just to finish to describe the actual way that the nest works, uh, this little bird, my, again, my very knowledgeable friends in Sri Lanka told me, it flies up uh, with its wings not sort of down close to its body, it zaps up the tunnel, and then uh, you can see in um, particularly these two in this cabinet, sort of on the sort of right-hand side, they're almost like a lung, and on the side that doesn't have the tunnel, but the other side, there's actually an inner chamber there, which is the actual nest where the, the eggs and the chicks uh, hatch. Um, and the idea is that a predator like a snake, if a snake got up, you know, wriggled along the branch, went down, all the way down the nest to the bottom of the tunnel, then it's got to do, and it's obviously impossible for a snake, finally, it's got to bend, a very sharp hairpin bend, go up that tunnel, and then it's got to bend again to the inner chamber. So this little bird goes to all that trouble to do that. And another thing I thought about, incidentally, a lot, was I made every nest here from an actual nest because I wanted it to look like an, a particular nest, not just like the idea of a nest. And indeed, every nest I worked from, every single nest, and many of them were in museums, including the Queensland Museum uh, here in Brisbane, um, I felt like I could never match up to the wonders of, and, of, and, and, and the particularity of that nest. And I guess it's a classic you know, statement that artists throughout history, I think, have made that you try and emulate nature, but in the end, it's impossible. Um, uh, and that's a lot, that gives you some food for thought as well.